reason why I'm doing this with you is that I just put that energy out there in the air so much for so long, as you know, about what a fan I was of the right. show. And I really believed that you really liked the show. I oh. can see it. So The first question I was going to ask you, which was, who were you before this show? What were you doing? Because for many, many people in an audience, you're kind of birthed on this show in their minds, in, mm -hmm. in the general audience's mind. I was, well, I was someone who always, you know, a guy who went to film school in the 60s, and I wanted to be in, in movies. Uh, I wanted to make feature motion pictures, and the first job I got was in television, and the first money came with it. What was the show? I'm not going to talk about this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I didn't work for a while at all. The first teleplay I ever wrote, I took three months to write it, and I didn't say, where's the script, kid? And... And I turned it in three months later, and then I didn't get rehired. I didn't work for another two years. And then I didn't worked on the Rockford Files. And this was the mid-70s. So at the time The Sopranos came on, I was what at that time would have been called an A-list showrunner. I had created one series, my, myself and another guy named Larry Connor, which had failed. You and Larry did what show? We did a show called Almost Grown with Tim Daly, who you also know, and Eve Gordon. So you had a relationship with Daly before? Yeah, he, D Daly was in the first thing I ever directed, which was an Alfred Hitchcock Presents episode back in the early 80s. So I had worked myself up to be, I had run, you know, I had worked on Northern Exposure and I'll Fly Away, and so I was considered an, I guess, an A-list showrunner, right? So I would have been hired... To do somebody else, to help make somebody else rich. Yeah. But also, who were you prior to this, I mean, in your own tastes and in your own passions, like when you grew up, did you watch TV? What did you watch? What I did watch. I did what do watch you remember? TV. I remember well. What, what I stuck? really loved. Yeah. Uh, Jackie Gleason. Right. Um, the Twilight Zone. Honeymooners or the show? The show and then the honeymooners. Yeah, I like the show better. Reggie Van Gleason, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Um, thriller, the old Boris Karloff thing. Maverick. You grew up where? Jersey. Where? Uh, Clifton at that time. What did your dad do? He uh, had a hardware store. How many kids did your parents have? How many brothers? Just me. Just you were an only child? Only child, yeah. And what did your mother do? She was a proofreader for the telephone company. She proofread the phone book. What kind of person was she? She was uh, a handful. So when you write things, because I do the same thing, I mean, if I, if I want to be entertaining, if I want to be colorful, I could launch into a depiction of my own mother, which is not necessarily accurate. Mm -hmm. It's entertaining, it's based on. Mm -hmm. Like when I talk about my childhood, there needs to be a disclaimer, of course, what I'm seeing this is based on right. actual events, right. influenced by actual events, right. not that they're actual events. If I, t if I told the story with rigorous honesty, they'd be changing the channel, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I've got to juice it up a little bit. Is the same thing true with you? Not exactly. Um, with my mother, you could give the real material, undiluted. Your mother wasn't like his mother? Very much, very similar, very similar. So that's autobiographical, to a degree? To a degree, yeah. That's to, to a degree. Yeah, she would say anything and it was all crazy. Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Negative. Sometimes I think there were very few times, but I think sometimes she was aware that she was uh, pressing the envelope, that she was entertaining by... Like the character in the by show. By being so out there, yeah. One of the things I notice about the show is that you have people that are incredibly cynical people and incredibly bitter, bitter, angry people. Mm -hmm. And and I think that all of them are to some degree. Some just manage it better than others. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. Yes, it is. It's not a light, uh, warm group of people. You know, do you well, find that? I, I used to think it was very funny when I was growing up that the, it used to be in the 50s and the 60s and big cinema, you know, cinemascope movies that Italians were always portrayed as Fun-loving, light-hearted, you, know, you know, lyrical with the mandolin and the spaghetti. And the, I never saw it. Right. The spaghetti, what, I saw it, but I didn't see it. What did you see? Dark. Dark. Uh, How? To the extent that you can say. Did you see these people when you were young? Yeah, I saw them all. Yes. That's what it, that's, without the profanity and without the violence and, uh, and the sexuality, that's... Uh, that's a fairly good representation of what my family was like. The sniping. The, well, I always describe them as, I used to say, everybody in the show is annoyed. Right. Always. They're always annoyed. Right. They are. Yeah. And I mean, I didn't, I, I, was, I was taking it less than cynical, which they are, but they're always annoyed. You look at an episode and you can almost say, in this episode today, it's your turn to have a holiday from being annoyed. Right. You don't have to be annoyed this one episode. We used to joke that, that um, two good alternative titles for the series would have been Poor You, because uh, 
That's what Livia always said to people whenever they were complaining, oh, poor you. And nobody did poor you as much as she did. She was the biggest sufferer of all. And the other title could have been, no good deed goes unpunished, because people in the characters used to say that all the time. They try to do something for somebody, then feel badly used and say, you know, it's like they say, no good deed, good deed goes unpunished. And those people didn't do a lot of good deeds, but they kept track of the ones they did. You know. So you have your family that you base this on to some degree, or you, you, they're, they're underneath there somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. What about I mean, I, can't, I don't want to give the impression that my family is, was just a bunch of misanthropes, because they were not. No. My grandmother, my father's mother, was the sweetest, you know, most wonderful person. I mean, Jennifer Melfi is named, Teresa Melfi was her name, is named after her. My uncles were fun. We had, we had a lot of good times. When I was a kid, we would go on Saturday night to my grandfather's house in Newark, and my mother had 11 siblings. So it was the siblings, the, their spouses, and all the children. And we would sit around this table, and my grandfather would just hold forth in Italian. Nobody else was allowed to talk. And then, then after that was over, we'd go upstairs and watch the Jackie Gleason show. Once in a while, we would go to a restaurant called Nanina's Restaurant in, in Newark. And I was, uh, you know, probably eight or nine years old. And you walk through a fish store, and there was, like, water all over the floor and ice and stuff like that. And you went into this, up this staircase, and there was a fish restaurant up on the top with one waiter, and the food came up in a dumb waiter. And I had the best times of my life in that restaurant. Yeah. And I got this sense that we, even then, I used to go to my friend's house in this apartment complex where we lived, you know, and their food was just, I don't know, just, what was it? You know, it was nothing. It wasn't your food. It wasn't, but it wasn't Italian. Italian food is, and I really realized it, it's really good. And also, even then, it was the only ethnic food you'd see around. It was Chinese food and Italian food. And I would say to myself, how come our food's all over the place? And I saw that early on. And it, and it, is, it stuck with me, and I mean, I could start eating that food right now, but... <laughs> <laughs> see, that's one of the great things about the show, is that what you love from your childhood, those things, that's in the show. It really is. That's in the show. I mean, it, to it, me, that's the glue. The reason for that is it is one of my favorite stories, not just Italian-Americans, but, but that's probably my gateway into it. I love the, the story of the American immigrant experience. I still love it, as it's going on now. I don't know what it is. I just love that story of people coming here to make it. And probably because I was a grandchild of immigrants, my, my grandparents didn't speak English. It's just, and, and I was born at a time where some of the old stuff really was still there, like in Newark where we lived. Throughout the show, particularly toward the end as it accelerated, what I, what I began to see, and you've heard this in other mob drama, you know, that's not the same, you know, Donnie Brasco, uh, you know, the old days, what it used to be like, and uh, the men aren't as honorable, and the code is completely different. But in your world, it goes beyond that, I think, because you had a television series to tell it over the arc of, there's the contraction of mob ritual and right the reason gangster movies were appealing is that in our day and age, everything's sort of corporate, national, uh, it's big. You, you, you're just a cog, and there's nothing tribal. And we are tribal at heart, and, and tribal, and so this is your tribe. And these are my guys behind me right here, and I'm part of this tribe. And the reason I brought up that whole thing about going to that fish restaurant was, even at a young age, I felt I was in a special group. I don't mean in, in elite in any kind, but just that I was part of something it was your own. It was my own. It was us people. Your family aside, or your family included, where does the, where does the understanding of the mob today come from? Did you ever have people from organized crime in any permutation try to suggest, did you go to them and ask them for storylines? Did you go to them to find out what's going on? It would happen twice. When we were first starting out, a guy at Brillstein Gray, which has produced the show, said there was a guy in his apartment in Studio City who had been in the witness protection program. And uh, he came in for one day, and, and uh, uh, that was, we didn't go beyond that. Because it just gets too, it becomes too personal. So we were always careful about that. And then another guy came in, a guy from Jersey, who'd been in, the, in one of the families out there, and we talked to him, and after two or three hours, he left, we left on a great note, and uh, he sued me, accused me of stealing all this stuff from his book. I never, and in fact, I'd given his book back to him as he left. So that was it. So all of it comes from your imagination. No, no, no. I, we were always really, really careful to try, to try to make it as much as like we could of the daily life of Italian-American organized crime in New York, New Jersey today. 
And where would you do your reference work? Cops? Uh, most of, I would say, 95% came from a guy named Dan Castleman, who was a, uh, had, still is, I guess, a prosecutor, and he worked for Morgenthau. So he was a New York State prosecutor? New York City. New York City, rather. So, so you had a guy that was a prosecutor under Morgenthau and he was had a technical pro advisor yes. to you? Yes, he had prosecuted one of the big garbage cases, one of the big car carding cases. How did season one unfold? Season one was a stretched out version of a movie idea that I had. And the movie idea was uh, this mid-level guy in the mob is having problems with his mother uh, and has always had problems with her. And he puts her in a nursing home and she becomes very bitter against him and he, he begins to see a therapist in it because of that. So it's a mob guy in therapy. And then, the ther then what happens is over the course of the therapy and the course of the movie, the therapist begins to, because of her ability with insights, begins to realize that his mother is his real enemy inside the mob before he does. And then when he finds out that it was his mother, he goes to the nursing home where he is, and she's already dead, and so he, can, he can't really even get his revenge or <laughs> get his, have his last argument with her. That was, the that was going to be a feature motion picture, which my agents told me that. And as a matter of fact, when, this, when, they, when HBO finally pulled the trigger on this, I was that same day, in the morning, I was down at Fox about to sign a deal, to do another develop, TV development deal in which I was going to work with Chris Carter running his show, Millennium. That was in the morning, and then I would find out after lunch. I went, in fact, I left Fox and went right to HBO in Century City, which is like right around the block. And they said they were going to buy it, and I was like, HBO was. And I thought, I really felt like I had ascended. To have, I was being like, uh, you know, I don't mean to be, Chris Carter's a really talented guy, and I would have enjoyed working on that show, but I really felt like I was being sort of lifted out of the muck in some kind of, sort of a religious, <laughs> religious way. I was just so glad that, that this was going to be different. I knew, I just knew working for HBO would be different. January of 99, your show comes on, and I remember saying to myself, oh, come on, what are they doing? That's what I thought people were going to say. So when I saw your show, I thought, what's going on? Did you feel that way? Oh, yeah. I you thought, were worried? Yeah, I was very worried. I was very worried. Plus, I worked very hard on it, and then, uh, and I, in fact, I went and saw Larry Connor. And he said, did you, ever, uh, did you ever hear this thing called Analyze This? I said, what's that? He said, that's a movie that De Niro's doing about a, a, a mobster in therapy. And I just, oh, Jesus. And so for a year, I thought, if this movie comes out first, we're finished, because we'll be the derivative television. And it didn't. And it didn't. And that's just luck. I mean, because we would have been just the derivative TV yeah. version. Even though the shows, the shows, the movies, the two projects are not similar, yeah. but... What were the ratings like the first season? It was a hit from the beginning. It was well, a hit from the beginning. Fortunately. It wasn't as big. I mean, it wasn't as big, and the ratings weren't... As it became. As it became, but it was, it was, oh my God, it was a sensation right off the bat. I mean, I've never had anything like that happen, and I probably won't again. It was unbelievable. Now, when you, when you take the first season, which was the motion picture screenplay, essentially diluted or, or expanded, expanded. Into, the, uh, uh, into the 13 episodes, then how did you approach the other seasons? You yourself wrote an arc for the year? I never thought there'd be a second season. And I've used this thing before, was that the show was like the Mirror Space Station. It was only supposed to be up for a year. And then it was up for two, three, four, five years, and yeah, you know, guess what? Yes, yeah, some of the panels were coming loose, and some people saw that, and some of the radio transmission was kind of feeble, and they saw that. The fabric's uh, getting a little yeah, warm. Exactly. It's one thing when you do a show that's a successful show, but it's very rare that a show, in this case, you had the, the uh, good fortune of being there at this wave that HBO was investing so much money in original programming, and then you guys come along, and it's complete. It's, it's cable programming that competes with broadcast programming, not just for prizes, but for audience share as well. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, when you started the show and you go to the end, how did the cable company's attitude toward you change? They did not argue too much. They were always very supportive. And there was never any censorship content-wise, never. Did you ever have an issue with them about censorship? No, the only thing that, it wasn't censorship, and I, I, probably people have heard this story before, was that in the first season, Tony takes his daughter away to college tour and he sees a, this guy back there, a rat, and he murders him. And Chris Albrecht called me up and said, you, he saw the finished show and he said, you, you, you can't do this. I said, what do you mean? He said, you created the most compelling TV character in the last 20 years and you're going to kill him in front of the audience. He's going to, four, four episodes later, he's self-destruct. And I said, well, I, see, I, don't, I said, I don't agree. I said, I'm beginning to realize unless this guy kills somebody, he's not a mob boss worth talking about. He said, we, we can't do this. And uh, he was convinced of this, and I was convinced that I was right. So we came up with a compromise in which um, 
we saw a little bit of the fact that the guy who got killed was a good reason to kill him. That was the only, I believe, content argument we ever had. So you are spared the downright idiocy of network notes that just come in reams when you do a network show. I don't... You worked in network TV. So what was the difference? Tom Fontana said it better than anybody else ever could. He said, the difference is it's like a week in Paris compared to a week in Albuquerque. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to remember that. I'm going to remember that. But also, in that way that you allow people to bring their game to the set and bring their technique to the set and show you what they've got. Because when I did Aviator with Marty and I had a small part, we went in and I sat down with, with Leo and we sat down and he said, who are you? I wanted to ask you, how you, that one in particular, how do you prepare to play Juan Trips? Well, I said, I'm a man who was a titan of industry. I said, I'm a man who, there was no mistake who he is. This is a man who helped birth the modern aviation business. And so I wanted to find a way to play a man who, you know, just didn't have a nerve in his body. He right. all goes his way. Now, my scenes with... Uh, they were great. I mean... Well, I appreciate that because, as I often tell people, if we played people who were historical figures the way they really were, the movie would be deadly dull. We must discover what is the idea inside the body of the piece that that character stands for. Mm -hmm. So, the end of the show, and I'm not going to ask you what that meant, because I really don't care in one sense, mm -hmm. in the sense of like, you know, you were uh, people prodding you and bothering you. But to me, it, it occurred to me that it was you reaching in and throwing a switch and saying, I really don't want to do this anymore. I can't think another day about these people and where they're going and what they're saying and what they care about. I have other things I want to think about now as a creative person. It's like, this has to end somehow. And it's going to end... It wasn't end. exactly that. No, I, you know what? I was always way too ambivalent about it, even at the end. I, 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 as, I, as we were doing all that, I thought, more I'm going to miss this. You know, you can keep going. You call up the phone, you pick up, you talk to Chris Albrecht again, I bet they'll say okay. But it was over. That story was over. We had told, I think, everything we had to say about that subject. I just got the sense that for you creatively, because you are very mighty creatively, that this had to end before you could move on to the next thing. It, that would have I never did anything else. You know, a lot of people do TV shows. They do three TV shows at a time, and they got their movie. And I never did that. They don't do very good TV shows. This though. is all I ever did, was this one show. And I could not stay there and do something else. Right. It, it wouldn't have worked out. But there was a lot of temptation to stay there and do what was easy. Complete and utter creative freedom. It was so hard to walk away from. And, uh, you know, it's not going to be like that again. One last thing I want to ask you, um, and that is, how do you feel about what you achieved? I mean, do you feel satisfied? Are you proud of yourself that you got something right? Well, I feel good because I sort of did... I th what I was trained to do, I thought that was my job, was to be entertaining, to make a show as, enter just throw everything but the kitchen sink in there and do it as well as you could. That was what you're hired for. And I, I think I did my job. And I, and what I was, the training that I got, I don't even know where this training came from, but I don't know, from reading Arthur Miller, or I don't know what, from going to the movies, from watching Marty Scorsese, what, what, uh, yeah, all that stuff. Really what it was about was um, just not shorting the audience, just give it to them. And you know, there's, 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 a, there's sort of this notion that, you know what, they don't care, and they won't understand it, so you don't have to put all these details in. You don't have to do that, and you have to tell them everything. You can't, like, hold anything back, and you can't expect they're going to care that something's happening on more than one level. You know, I was resisted that, and sometimes I'd find myself falling into that mindset. You get tired, you know, and actually I think the show proved to me that that wasn't the case, that the audience was there, and that they would care. And they want, they crave those details. And they, they want those inconsistencies. Why is Uncle Junior saying that? He just said that he was not in the Army. And that's the kind of thing in the network. Well, was he in the Army or wasn't he in the Army? It doesn't matter. He's lying, you know? Um, and even if he's not lying, it doesn't matter. But it doesn't matter. There's something else going on. And I think the show sort of made me feel good about the audience and that... These other people who say all that stuff are wrong. It's there to be done, you know. You can, they, they really do want to be swept away. They don't want to be bored. They don't want to be talking on their cell phone when they're watching TV. Not really. When your show was on, people never dared call my house when that show was on. Yeah, a lot of people said that. Well, you know what part of it is? It's, it's, it's actually expecting the audience to bring something to the party, which is their attention. Listen to this because it might be important later. And this is why I'm so excited to see what you do next. I'm dying. <laughs> 
No, no, but I'm dying to see what you do next. Because what happens in the movie business is you're gonna come along and you're gonna be the guy that they're gonna sit there and say, you know, we make potato chips 90% of the time and 10% we wanna get into the fine dining business and we gotta be very careful who we give the keys to that car to. Mm. They're very they are, careful. That's true. They're they are. That's the careful. good way to put it. They are careful about how, very how careful often they give the people the keys they give to them the keys to that car. <laughs> I can only bring to the discussion what I'm told, and that is that you're very hands-on with everything, from the music to the casting to all of it. It all has your fingerprints on it. And how did casting for the show begin when you began? Once HBO actually got involved with it, then you know, it was the conventional method. Sheila and George Ann were hired, and they started talking to me about acting. I had some people in mind for a few things. There were people that you wanted. Not for Tony, not, 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 not for Tony. And how did that happen with Jimmy? Well, they said, you know, I think it was Sheila. Have you, have you seen James Gandolfini? And I said, I don't, I don't think I know who that is. And then I remembered I'd seen him in Angie. It's a domestic comedy with Gina Davis. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, maybe, you know. Um, and he came as part of that process. He came to my house, actually, went on tape. He was, you know, he was great. What about him did you like for the role? How can you explain it? I mean, you see it, there, there you go. It's one of the beautiful, like, mysteries of what we do, you know? I look at him and I just think, it would not have happened without I mean, you know, People say that all the time, but it's obvious. To me, and again, I don't want to get into my long diatribe of the moments that resonated for me, because it all resonated for me, quite frankly. But, you know, my I mean, the big man, the, 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 the bear of a man, or a mountain of a man, is obviously always more effective when he lays back. Mm -hmm. So when he leans into his son in the garage and says to him, Don't put me to the test. That was the most chilling line. <laughs> to say to your son alone in a room, don't put it to the test. Mm -hmm. I thought, this kid's gonna get his fucking skull dribbled on the sidewalk like a mm -hmm. basketball. He had so much to do. So much of the show was on his huge shoulders. He worked so hard. What kind of person can I be where his own mother wants him dead? The problem is not with you. That woman is a peculiar duck. She always has been. Yeah, but that's not the point. You no, know, and she's gotten worse with age. You think my mother didn't warn me about her on my wedding night? Please, don't start with that again. Both your sisters left New Jersey so young, you would have thought there were contracts out on them. I know. But you were different. You tried to make it work. I said to Edie, I said, you did so many little things that were such generous things, and she just looked at me like, because you can see she's doing them unaware, they're just natural to her. The way you'd put your hand on his back and rub his back. You know, there were things you did. You loved Tony and you petted him like he was a horse, mm -hmm. you know? There were little things you did. The way you looked at him, there were so many things. She's probably one of the most generous actresses I've ever seen on film in my life. In terms of what we learn about him and what we grow to, how we grow to regard him through her eyes. She was so loving toward him. I know. Oh my I know. God. It's very, very, com very complex. It's really fascinating. I mean, she's an illustration of, like, to me, you know, and I mean, actually, take part of the process. Acting is the is like one of the great mysteries. How, what, how that that actually can be, and how it works, and how you people do that is, um, it's fa it's really fascinating. There's no answers really. But what is it about her? Why is it because she went to acting school? No, is it because is it because she's intelligent? I don't think intelligence is vital, is it? And I guess Carmela is the thinking man's Don's wife. Ma, now I've told Tony, and I've told you many times. You know you can always come and live with us. I know when I'm not wanted. 
I just invited you to come and share my home. You want me to beg, that's different. That son of mine, is he still having those fits? Well, they're not fits, Ma. They're anxiety attacks. I know he's on medication. How did you find Nancy Marchand? We had 100, 125 actresses come up, and we were dead, nobody. And you tilted toward Italian actresses, because you tilted told me you tried. We, we tilted, but we ran out of them very early on. And we thought they would have a better understanding of it, and it just wasn't, wasn't really working. And we were going to start shooting, I think, in two or three days, and we had nobody. And what did you see in Nancy that... She just did it. She came up the stairs. She was already fairly ill by that time, and she sat down, and she just did it, and there it was. How was she on the set to work with? Great. She was buoyant. She was a strong woman, fairly, I think, reserved. I think trying to, she was not well, so she was trying to conserve her energies a lot. And kill me now. Go on, go, go into the ham, and take the carving knife, and stab me, here, here. Now, please! It would hurt me less than what you just said. Oh, Ma, you gotta stop. You gotta stop with this. This black poison cloud all the time, because I can't take it anymore. Oh, poor you. This happens to me all the time. And I think it happens to a lot of people. You write a script, and um, you start to cast, and people come in, you go, okay, well, that, obviously that person did that much talent. Okay, who's next? After about four days, you're going, I know what the problem is here. It's this. It's the material. Do you feel that way? This is no good. That's it, you start to think. We th okay, 80 actors have read this now, and it's, it's just <clears> sitting <throat> there on the page. This is no good. And then, boom, somebody comes in. So, Nancy Marchand. Yes, Nancy Marchand, Jim Gandolfini, Michael Imperioli. Gone. That's it. Go down a wardrobe. Where did you find Imperioli? Goodfellas. Spider. Yeah, Spider. Don't make a big deal out of it, Spider. <laughs> I love that line. You're going to make a big fucking deal out of it, huh, Spider? He blows his foot off. I know. I he know. was Spider. You know, my cousin Gregory's girlfriend is what they call a development girl out in Hollywood, right? She said I could sell my life story, make fucking millions. I didn't do that. I stuck it out with you. I'm fucking kill you. What are you going to do? Go ahead and refill on me now? How many mobsters are selling screenplays and screwing everything up? She said I could maybe even play myself. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Forget Hollywood screenplays. Forget those distractions. Huh? What do you think, I have in that office? He seemed so needy, Christopher. He seemed like such a boy, such a child. His character didn't die until, what, three shows, three or four shows from the end? And we, even though we only had three or four more shows to go, and we were winding down to the end, I remember thinking to myself, I wonder if we're gonna have a show without him, even for those three or four episodes. I was really worried. Never pass a drug test. Call me taxi. Why did you kill his wife, Adriana? Because that's, it had to happen. You know, was, uh, <laughs> that was the, the, the given their business the given life. Given the circumstances? Given the circumstances. Given, given the business, business you know, we've chosen? Yeah, given the business we've chosen, it had to she happen. She had to go? She had to go. And you know, I, nobody wanted to do it, because everybody loves Drea, and Drea was great, and. Talk about that. What do you mean nobody wanted to do it? Well, again, we thought, whoa, is there a, sh we had a show without her? I can't imagine what it's like when you kill off a character on a show like that. It was really hard to take. It was really hard to take. She's the only character who you didn't see take the hit. Right. You didn't see blood effects no on splat. her. And I, you know what? It's a, it's a strange form of sexism, probably. She was an attractive, pretty woman, and I didn't want to see that. And that decision came back to haunt us because people kept saying, she's not really dead. See, you never saw her get shot. When Van Zant learned that you'd chosen well, he him, 
He no. Well, he was happy. He, no. Well, he was going to get to kill somebody. He was going to get to kill her. It was a big character. Van Zandt shot a lot of people on yeah. the show. That's when he first came on. He said, "All I want to do, shoot somebody. You gotta, you gotta let me murder somebody. It's all I want to do. That's all I want to do. That's all I want to do. I don't want to be on the stage. I want to." <laughs> Van Zandt kills. The guy that's the rat. That's right. Shoots him in the back of the head with Imperioli. Right, exactly. Fucking punk ass pieces of shit. Would you forget I'm a captain? Well, why don't you call for help in your radio mic, you fucking rat? Oh, God. What's the matter? You're not wearing one tonight? Nah. He didn't have time to put on anything decent. God. He was very melodic in his speech. Stevie. Oh, my God. Sometimes you go, wow, he's really, he's very colorful. Yeah. The hair, the clothes. Yeah, yeah. He brought all that to the party himself? He did, absolutely. He did. I mean, you know, when we actually started shooting, obviously there was direction was given. Make sure you clean that shit off her tit. We know, Atlantic City, forget it. Why the change up? I can't keep fighting Phil on this. Our businesses are all entwined. You gotta pick your battles. You want your no-show jobs, Vito's gotta go. It's the right move, Chief. Was Frank Vincent somebody you were going to hesitate to cast because he'd done so much mob stuff in the film? Frank Vincent, that's kind of an interesting story. He read for, I think, Uncle Junior. And he read uh, for somebody else, I forget, maybe Pauly. And um, as it turned out, we hired Michael Imperioli and Lorraine in pretty big roles. And I said, well, we can't have somebody else from Goodfellas. We just can't do it to myself. And he was really good. And then he said to me, he said, I hope you'll think, you know, you really consider me for this role because, I mean, I thought my reading was very good. He said, you know, if you want the softer version, then you got Dominic Chinese. But it, I, I really, I'm really hope, hopeful that I get this. But I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. So we couldn't use Frank. And then five years later, it came around. And by that time, it was perfect. And he was just so good. He was just so great. Put on 1010 winds, the tunnel's a parking lot. I hope you didn't get caught in that. You said you're gonna take care of that fucking Fenoik. Oh, for Christ's sake. Fucking Vito again? What the fuck is wrong with you? He's in town, isn't he? I was at Marie's the other night. She played the innocent. But I could tell she'd seen him. You're fucking Karnak the Great now, too, huh? I gotta tell you, Anthony, if Vito was here and you knew about it... Dominic was perfect. He was just perfect. And so to play was Uncle Junior. Uncle Junior. How did you meet him? Dominic just came in. Yeah. Incredible. Oh, he's amazing. You see him young in The Godfather, it's incredible. Oh, my God. I know. He's really something. He's, uh... he's a great actor, Dominic. Oh, my God. And Dominic is a real poet, you know. After the first season, he'd done great work. As the antagonist, he was the guy, right? Uncle Junior was the guy. He'd done great stuff, but now he wasn't killed, but he was in prison. So I had to make this phone call. I called him. I said, Dominic, listen. You know, we've been picked up, we're gonna come back, but I have some kind of bad news. I said, because you know the way the plot went. I said, and you're basically gonna be in jail this season. And, and uh, actually, I think you're probably gonna wind up making, we're gonna have to cut the number of episodes. He said, well, you know what? Thank you for calling me. He said, uh, he, I have great faith in the creative process and the muse. He said, look, David, I'm the stone. You are the architect. You pick up the stone, you put it where you want. You put it at the top of the arch, you put it down below. I'm the stone and you are the architect. And I have great, great confidence in the muse. And I'm sure this will work out. And it did. What next? There's a man upstairs having store for me. You're lucky he was sprained, not broken. The thing is, Doc, I've been feeling these, like, little fibrillations. Psychosomatic. You got out of jail out of medical. It's the mind-body connection. Your body's just pitching in to help. Oh, he's a poet. He's not Uncle Junior by any stretch of the imagination. And he's so soft and lyrical and sensitive. And he's great. <laughs> So you've got three people from Goodfellas and one guy from The Godfather. And I think, I actually think Sirico was in Goodfellas too. I'm not even sure he had a speak. I think he said at a speaking role. Talk about him, that actor. He's one of my favorite stories. Actually, after we did this, we just did, uh, we did this, this show called The Ride which is about the Italian-American feast in the last season. And uh, Carolyn Strauss, who was one of the people at HBO, after, after having watched seven seasons of this, she saw that episode. She loved Paulie, and she loved Paulie and his mother. She loved the, that dynamic. And I said, well, did you, see, uh, did you see the cut of the ride? And she said, yeah. She said, oh, Paulie. She, I, I said, yeah. It's, she said, he needs so much. <laughs> and I thought, that really is Paulie Walnuts. He just needs so much. Hello, Paulie. What are you doing here? 
one of our outings. So you're still over there, huh? They've been very nice, and your brother's trying to work out an arrangement. Is it true what they're saying? Who? Oh, about what? The ride, the one that broke. You need to make a novena, Paulie. Those poor children. Well, what are you talking about? You let St. Elzia go without his hat. Well, will you listen to this? Fuck that voodoo, eh? You cursed your mother, a blessed nun. She had it coming. You both did. I didn't bring you up like that. You were fake. That's how you brung me up. Fuck the two of you. When Tony first came on, he was very concerned about maintaining his masculinity. He always stands like this when he's talking, because he says, you know, if they go to hit you, go like that really quick. And we began to realize that he was very fastidious. He always squirted one of those things in his mouth and, and, and you know, wore a lot of cologne. And, you know, we opened up and spent time with him. And little by little, we began to put that stuff in the show. And little by little, he began to loosen up. Tony would never let anybody work with his hair. Our hair people could never touch him. He did his he own He would hair. get up at 5 o'clock in the morning at his house. Don't, you don't touch it. And then in the third season, he was having a nightmare. The character was having a nightmare, and his hair was supposed to be messed up. And that was a big, it was a big watershed event. He didn't want it to happen. He fought it. And so the director said, well, then fine, then we'll go with a hairnet. <laughs> so he said, all right, all right, all right. And after that, this is the, my perception of it. After that, he was much more open, and he, he became that, that guy you see, which has so many different colors. I dream I make my peace. He was dead. Science said he was dead. Science. You need to talk to someone who deals with this kind of thing professionally. What kind of thing? He's in New York, Paulie. In Nyack. His name is Cullen. He's a psychic. A psychic? Get the fuck out. He's yeah. painful to watch because yeah. he's so super masculine. That's and it. it right? He's so super masculine on one hand. His whole kind of animal is so masculine. And then he's got the whole peacock thing with the hair and the, and the tinting. I mean, he looks like, like uh, you know, he's something out of Antique Roadshow. You know what I mean? The way they tint the hair and everything. It's all so he does perfect. We, he, we don't do it. You're right. It's, it's, all, it's all just too... It's all too, the, the cuffs and the this, yeah. he's so perfectly manicured. He has perhaps the widest range in his vulnerability and in his, his vulnerability. animal. None of that happened until he would agree to play funny. And he never agreed to play funny. When he started doing some of the clownish things he didn't want to do, having his hair messed up and showing, being shivering, in the, that's when you began right. to see it. Before that, when it was all this stuff, you didn't see that. Right. When it was all butch. When it was all, yeah. Come here, come here, you know. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, his character, Paulie, is one of the first to vote for Vito to get whacked. He's one of the first to vote for Vito to get whacked. How did that come about? The Vito storyline, where you've got a guy in the mafia who turns out to be a gay mobster. Well, that was based on something that happened in, in reality. Somebody around here in the 90s, a wise guy was, was clipped, I think, a captain, because uh, I think he talked about being gay. I don't even think he'd been caught. Where did you know him from? How did he come along? He came along in the first season. He was a customer buying uh, some Italian bread in that callback of, uh, of Goodfellas, Spider. Imperial shoots the kid in the foot. Joe Ganascoli was a the guy there saying, what about my Neapolitan loaves or something like that? He had one line. Hey, Gino, can I get you? He's some, um... Whoa, whoa, number 34, right here. He was in line, man. He just went out to go get gas in his car. Hey, poppin' fresh, I'm in no fucking mood today. I'm next. Now get a fucking pastry box. Gino, what can I get you? Oh! It's all right, Doug. You let him go first. Nah, he don't make the rules here. All right, let me have uh, two Neapolitan loaves. You touch uh, a single fucking crust, you're gonna wish you took that job at McDonald's. Fuck you. Okay, take a walk. Oh, my friend. You come back in 10 minutes. He never lost any of the authority or the menace yeah. or the hate. Yeah. You know, when he, when he goes to really lean on Meadow's boyfriend, who sees him going down on the guy on the construction site in the early goings of this whole thing. When he comes and gets him in the bathroom and everything, I mean, he's just terrifying. That's he's Terry Winter. Terry Winter wrote that. And then, 
Sound like a racehorse pissing in there. Hey, how's it going? Finn de Trollio, my arch nemesis. You enjoying yourself here? It's all right. I keep telling you, you shouldn't work so hard. Long hours, this fucking heat. Plus, you came in so early today. I just do what the job is. Good. You're strong. That helps. You know you can call me Vito. Yeah, I, I know. So say it. Let me hear you say, what's up, Vito? What's up, Vito? Not much, Finn. Except I got a little surprise for you. So when he turned, when he when, when you play him manifest as gay, Terry wrote those first episodes. I guess that's when he was outed in that episode, right? Going down Terry the truck. Wrote, yeah, Terry wrote that. How'd you meet Terry? I met Terry because one of the writers who worked for us then, Frank Renzulli, insisted that I read Terry's material. And I read a script, which uh, I wasn't that crazy about. Um, and we, I passed. And he wasn't there the first season. And Frank Renzulli, who was working for us then, they were friends. So you got to take another look at Terrence Winter. So I read the script again. It was better. We gave him a shot. He came on, and then just, boom. He's, I, I can't say enough of... Um, he was like a right hand to you. I always said if, if he, if, if, if I had gone into the hospital with a heart attack, he, he could have done the show. That was the Why only is that? guy. What about... He just, he breathed it. It came from the inside. Sometimes you've deviated from the Italian-only rule in, in some things that are less significant and other times very significant, like it's Winter like, being your right hand now. So when you broke the Italian-only the Italian -only rule, which you broke with Eiler. He's not Italian. Not Italian. He's German. German and Irish, I and guess. And Jamie is Jewish. Right. Winter, and Cuban. And Cuban. Yeah. Well, that explains it. <laughs> and Winter is, he's what? He's English. I mean, I'm, we didn't have any choice. If I could have hired, and it's probably, you know what, what you're saying means my rule is for shit. Because obviously all those people acquitted themselves great without being Italian. So well, what's the whole thing about it? But I think in a strange way, I'm, I'm from the school of, I don't think it would have happened t t on some level without any of the people that you had. I think all of the casting across the board was well, miraculous. Thank you. They, I mean, thank for, um, I'm speaking for them. Thank you.